Good morning and welcome to the LEA Special Education Point of Contact monthly webinar. Today is November 15th, 2017. My name is Annette Thacker Bartlett and I am with the Aussie Division of Teaching and Learning. And I am joined today by Leah Diggs Natico and Rita Larkins from the Aussie Division of Data Assessment and Research. Others who have contributed to this webinar are from the Aussie Division of K-12 Systems and Support. Throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, please type them in the question chat box. We will do our best to answer those questions as we go along. And we can stay on the line for a few minutes afterwards to continue answering your questions. Today's agenda, we're going to start out talking about data privacy and SEDS access. Then we are going to move and talk to talk about your students who are attending non-public programs right now and some of the things that you can do to ensure that they are being fully served while they are at those separate campuses. Then we are going to spend a few minutes talking about oversight of related service provision in general, both at the LEA campuses and at your non-public campuses. Then we will discuss a few reminders about the alternate assessment application process as that deadline is coming up very quickly. And we will end the webinar with reminders and announcements about a few other things, including upcoming professional development opportunities. But first, let's get a sense of who we have here in the audience. I'm gonna launch a poll question asking you what your current role is relating to the LEA Special Education Point of Contact. This webinar today is designed for those of you who are the main point of contact, meaning that you oversee special education for your entire LEA. That means you might have a central office role or you might have a school level role and you're a smaller charter school and so you essentially are overseeing special ed across your entire LEA, whether that LEA is one campus or multi-campus. Thank you for taking a moment to answer the poll question. And as you can see here on the screen, uh, most of you are the main point of contact for your entire LEA. Some of you assist the point of contact in various roles. So that is also great that you are listening in today. And it looks like a good chunk of you are DCPS LEA representatives, meaning that you function as a type of special ed point of contact at the campus level for a DCPS school. So we welcome you today as well. Some things in this webinar will not be applicable to you if you are not the main point of contact over the entire campus. However, it is always great to be informed so that you can know how to support the main point of contact for your LEA. Okay, let's get started talking about data privacy and SEDS access. First, I wanna remind you about personally identifiable information or PII. This is, a, uh, this is a phrase that's used widely across many different sectors, including in education. As a special education point of contact, you have a lot of access to a lot of student information that's very sensitive, um, including things about the student, such as their social security number, birth date, name, as well as things about their disability and their special education services. And so we just wanna remind you that you need to be mindful of data privacy as you are sharing information in the course of your role. And we also want to remind you that um, if you are ever sharing information with Aussie, and there are many valid reasons for you to need to share the sensitive information with Aussie, we remind you to please never send that information over email. So this is any personally identifiable student information. Please don't send it over email. The Aussie support tool allows you to securely share this information and you often need to do that in the course of submitting an Aussie support tool ticket. That's a way to go, that's the best way uh, for you to share this type of information as you're going back and forth with Aussie to troubleshoot any issues over specific students, whether it's a SEDS issue or what. And if you want to read more about 
student data privacy, the link is at the bottom of this page to our data privacy statewide policy. So speaking of data privacy and access, as the LEA special ed POC, you are the main person responsible for your entire LEA to control the access to SEDS, including access to all of the student files within SEDS. So we strongly encourage you to do periodic SEDS user audits. As you know, staff turnover happens not just at the beginning of the year, but throughout the year. And also a staff member's role may change. They may take on a new role where they no longer need to have access to SEDS or access to specific student files within SEDS. So please uh, set a schedule for yourself or some kind of process, put reminders on your phone, whatever it takes to remember to um, periodically go through and look at every person's profile who has access to your students data at your LEA and here's an easy way to do that um, step one you would go into SEDS and open up the users tab on the users tab um, check all the boxes and then uncheck the small amount of boxes here for Aussie staff. There are a few user types. You can see that I've circled here on the screen that are for Aussie staff because we also, some Aussie staff do need access to your student files, but please never um, change anything about the Aussie level of access. That's something that we need to control at the state level. So uncheck those boxes. Um, so that you, uh, I mean, you can leave them check if you, if you want to see who at Aussie has access to your students, but um, please don't alter that access. But um, checking all the rest of the boxes will be an easy way to get a big long list of who has access to your LEA's SEDS account. It'll show a screen like this with a long list of names. And you as the LEA special ed POC should have this far left hand column. It's the delete column. You should have this column and by checking those boxes, you can select user accounts to inactivate. It doesn't actually delete their account, it just inactivates their account so that they cannot access sensitive student files. So uh, pulling up this list of users, you can sort it by name, by title, by user type, you can sort it by school campus. Clicking on the top column will um, refilter it alphabetically, either A to Z or Z to A, just by clicking on it. it should make it easy for you to do, to um, inactivate several accounts all at the same time in an efficient way. So this is a tip that we have for you on how to easily do a user audit. And of course, if you inactivate somebody by accident or you inactivate them and then later they, ha they then need access again to their SEDS account, you can easily reactivate any user profile by following these steps here on the screen. So this is for your reference. And again, we strongly encourage you to do periodic SEDS user audits. Now, how often you do that user audit, that's up to you. It probably depends on how many staff you have at your school, how often there is turnover, um, but it, we are relying on you and you are held responsible for ensuring that access is limited to only the appropriate people to your LEA's SEDS account. Now, you also, as the LEA Special Ed POC, have the ability to create brand new SEDS accounts for staff. And we give this ability to you because it saves time for everybody, so you don't have to come to Aussie to ask for new SEDS accounts every time you have a new Special Ed teacher or service provider. You can very easily create the account yourself for them. But with, with that said, please be careful when you are creating their account that you restrict it to the appropriate level of access. And also, please keep in mind, you should never be creating SEDS accounts for non-public staff. In a few minutes, I will talk more about the appropriate way to get a SEDS account in place for non-public staff or to reactivate that account if it was inactivated or to troubleshoot issues with <clears throat> access there. For non-public staff, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But for now, this is focusing on your LEA campus or LEA central office level staff you have the ability to create accounts for them. And when you do, you have to determine the user type. And I want to point out to you that some user types, I've shown them all here on the screen, some user types have an asterisk next to them. 
that means that particular user type will allow them to have access to students across all of your campuses, meaning all your LEA campuses and all of your non-public campuses where you have students currently attending. So um, please think carefully about whether or not that person needs to have this broad of access to all your campuses or if they should have a more restricted user type according to their role. For example, if they only serve students at a certain campus. And I've circled here at the bottom of the page the, the uh, warning message that you get in, that you will see in SEDS that reminds you of what it means for some of these user types to have that asterisk. So once you have created their user profile as part of that, you have to decide how many campuses they have access to. Uh, for most of your staff, they typically are probably only working at one campus, whether that's a non-public campus or, or excuse me, we'll talk about non-publics in a few minutes. Uh, most of your staff probably only work at one campus. It is possible that you have a related service provider who works at multiple campuses for your LEA or somebody in more of an administrative position that needs access to multiple campuses. Um, but generally speaking, you should only probably only need one campus. So there have been times when ASEA has discovered that that um, some staff members, for example, a provider, uh, let me just show you a picture on the next page. Um, so I pulled up some, this is a list of occupational therapists for an LEA. Um, for data privacy, I'm not showing the names of these, of these service providers, but this is an example of showing when I pull up a list of the OTs, you can easily see what campuses they have access to. And so here is an occupational therapist who has access to 17 different campuses. Is it possible that that provider goes around and provides services to all of those students or that they have some kind of supervisory or administrative role where they need access to 17 campuses? That is possible. Again, Aussie doesn't know that. That's up to you as the LEA special ed POC to ensure that the level of access each staff member has is the appropriate level of access. Um, so pulling up a bunch of user profiles all at the same time, you can do a very easy, just by glancing, you can see very easily what level of access each user has according to the schools listed in their profile. And by checking or unchecking the box on that user's profile, you can change that level of access. Now, speaking of non-public staff, this is a separate situation. Um, at, because you are the LEA SEPOC, technically you do have the ability, you, have, you physically have the ability to go in and create a brand new SEDS account for a non-public staff member. You can create a SEDS account for whoever you want, technically, for uh, you know, your, your, um, your friend down the street or whatever, but um, in your role, you are, you are responsible for ensuring that SEDS accounts only get created for the appropriate people. So, um, so you have great power in this role. Non-public staff, yes, they need, they need access to your LEA's SEDS site, but you should not create them a new account. You, should, you need to let Aussie do that. And Aussie will create an aggregate account, which allows that particular non-public staff member to have access to multiple LEA said sites via one common login. Um, now you may be thinking, well, this non-public only has students from my LEA. They don't need access to any other LEAs, so why can't I just make them the account? Well, we still ask that you do not create them a SEDS account. Let Aussie handle it. Even if their aggregate account only has one LEA, for now, it's possible they could get more students from other LEAs in the future. And in that case, we don't want to have to um, consolidate or recreate accounts. So, um, and non-publics, they will come to you. They will ask you. This happens all the time. A non-public SEDS point of contact will come to you and say, hey, I have a new speech therapist who is serving Johnny at, from your LEA. They need a SEDS account. Please create them a SEDS account. Here's their email address. Here's their name. Don't do it. Please remind the non-publics that they need to first go to Aussie, and the non-public SEDS point of contact does have an account with the Aussie support tool, goes to Aussie, requests that an aggregate account gets set up. Aussie will set up that account. Then step two, then that non-public 
POC comes back to you and says, okay, now they have an account. Now I need you as the LEA SC POC to update their profile to grant them access to your students. And again, um, we talked about this earlier, be very careful about what boxes you check for them. If they are a non-public staff member, they most likely only need access to the students that are from your LEA attending their specific campus. So do not check boxes for your LEA public campuses because a non-public provider is only does not need access to all your students at all your other campuses. They only need access to the students at their campus. So please be careful when you're doing that because this could end up violating FERPA and all kinds of data privacy things. So, and this is part of the user audit you should do. When you're doing your user audit, your periodic SEDS user audit, for non-public staff members, please double check that they only have access to the school that they work at. Now, after you give them access, it's possible that there's still something going on. There's, especially at the beginning of the year, but also throughout the year, issues pop up where a service provider at a non-public still cannot see the student. And they get really frustrated, like, I'm providing services, I need to log the services, everybody's telling me to log the services, but I cannot see the student. So this is a checklist that you should go through that you, as the LEA, should work together with the non-public SEDS point of contact, work together on behalf of that service provider to troubleshoot. These are the steps that we recommend that you follow where you should be able to solve the problem yourself if it's one of these things. So just double check in your information system that the students attending campus is correct. So go check with your registrar. We always advise you to start there if there's not any other obvious reason for the, um, for the issue because um, sometimes it's just that there's an error in the student information system. So double check with that. Make sure that the service provider has access has the right level of access in their user profile. Make sure that the service provider, that their profile has the box checked for the type of services that they can provide. These are called the, the can provides. Here's a, an example on the screen of a service provider where the LEA SCPOC has checked the box to say they are authorized to provide behavior support services for the students at the LEA that go to that non-public. And of course, check the IEP. Sometimes it's a matter of the service is not prescribed on the IEP and therefore it never is gonna show up in the logging wizard for, this, for the service provider. And make sure that the caseload's been assigned correctly. After you go through all these steps and there is still an issue with the service provider at the non-public not being able to log services for the student, then please submit a ticket in the Aussie support tool and Aussie will work with you to do further investigation. All right, now let's talk about best practices in oversight of non-public services. And before we do that, I wanna get a sense of how many students do you have enrolled in your LEA who are currently attending a non-public program. Now, if you're from DCPS, you definitely would check the box for over 50 students, because I know DCPS has a very large amount of students attending non-publics, and that's just simply because DCPS is the largest LEA in the city. Um, for the rest of you, if you are a smaller charter school, you probably have a smaller amount of students you're a larger multi-campus charter school, you probably have a larger amount of students who are attending non-public campuses, but of course still enrolled at your LEA. Thanks for voting. I'm gonna go ahead and close that poll. And you can see here with the results that about one third of you do not have students attending a non-public at this time. A third of you have a small amount of students, and then um, some of you, presumably those of you from DCPS, your LEA has a large amount of students. Now, um, you if you are the main LEA special education point of contact, that means one of your responsibilities is uh, literally to oversee what's going on with these students at the non-public campuses. If you are 
um, a DCPS LEA representative, more at a more at a school level. Um, it's a different team at the DCPS central office that oversees what's going on with students in the non-public. If you are a part of that 32% that does not have a student at a non-public right now, um, please don't tune out because it is possible that at any time you could have a student go through the non-public placement process and end up getting placed at a non-public program. Or you could have a student transfer to your LEA who is already attending a non-public program and will continue to attend that non-public program and you will be responsible for that. So this information is definitely relevant for um, all of you at this time. So a quote, so LEAs, the students still belong to you and Aussie holds the LEA ultimately responsible for making sure that the student gets the services they need, regardless of whether or not, whether or not the non-public does their job. At the end of the day, the student is enrolled in the LEA and Aussie turns to the LEA for monitoring and compliance purposes to say, okay, what's going on with this student? Um, just to ensure FAPE and all of those basics. Now, with that said, obviously the student is attending a totally separate campus if they're at a non-public, and um, the non-public is going to be providing a lot of those services on behalf of the LEA. Um, but you, as the LEA SPED POC, still need to keep a very close watch over what is going, what is going on. Um, there, there are laws and regulations in place that govern non-public programs, the, the certificate of approval regulations. There, it, um, there are laws that are spelled out pretty detailed about what non-publics um, should be able to do with regards to student safety and all sorts of different things. And we do have a team at Aussie who monitors non-public programs to make sure they are in compliance with those regulations. However, the laws and regulations do not go into super detailed instructions on who's in charge of what. So there's a lot of gray area when it comes to students and non-publics with regards to who is responsible for what. So because the student still belongs to you as the LEA, you actually have quite a bit of say in what the non-public does or does not do for each student and how that happens. Um, for example, if you have as an LEA, if you have specific policies and procedures around annual IEP updates or reevaluations, assessments, um, about how far in advance you start to, you know, invite the parent to a meeting, um, about missed services, if you should have a policy at your LEA for missed services that gets really detailed about what happens with like snow days and things like that. All of those things, the non-public should be aware of those things and they should be following those things when it comes to your students who attend the non-public. So um, this section is gonna focus on best practices and what you should be doing as the LEA to oversee what's going on with the students at non-publics. And I say best practices because there's not um, very much in the law that spells things out very black and white, but there are things that you that you can do to um, to implement these best practices to make sure that everybody knows what's going on and that communication is very clear between you and the non-public, and that the student re fully receives their IEP services and those things. So, a memorandum of agreement or an MOA is a best practice that you could put in place with each of your non-public programs where you have students attending. If you don't already have this in place, it is something we'd like you to strongly consider um, so that there never is a question of like who's in charge of what or the non-public thinks you're doing something but you thought they were doing it and the ball gets dropped, etc. And just to reinforce good communication with the non-public. And as the LEA SEPOC, you are by default the one that should be coordinating with the non-public for um, overseeing what's going on with students. Um, but you could have delegated this to another staff member or another team member at your LEA. You might have somebody else who specifically liaisons with the non-public, the non-publics where you have students. It's just sort of up to your LEA how you structure things. Um, so if there is somebody else that's involved with this, definitely pass this information along to them. So 
um, suggested areas where you might wanna spell things out pretty clearly with the non-public is um, for annual IEP updates, reevaluation, communicating with parents, related service provision, and the documentation of related service provision in SETS. Um, here is, there's just a couple slides here where we have suggested areas that you put into your memorandum of agreement. And again, this is not a mandated requirement by Aussie. You do not have to do an MOA, but we just suggest that you do or to have something similar. Um, in fact, back in January, Aussie's non-public monitoring team here at Aussie, they gave a webinar to the non-public leaders explaining to them the benefits of having an MOA in place with each of the LEAs that they serve uh, for these same reasons of really spelling it out so that there's no gray area and nobody's left to wonder about, um, well, I thought you were doing that assessment. Or, well, I thought you were doing that assessment. Or, or sometimes non-publics think that the LEA is going to log everything in SEDS, and so they don't do anything in SEDS, and the LEA expects the non-public to be logging things in SEDS and, and so on. So just to really spell it out and make it clear who's doing what. So there's a link here to a recording of that full webinar that talks more, much more in depth about the MOA. If this is something that you're interested in learning more about or putting into place, I encourage you to um, click that link and go watch that webinar. I believe it's about a one hour webinar or you can access the slide deck on that same link if you wanna browse through the slides. Um, and so on this slide are just topics that you might consider putting into the MOA to spell out who's doing what. Um, even for things like who's coordinating with Aussie for when there's issues or um, progress progress reports. Um, who's who's going to finalize the progress report? Do you expect the non-public to finalize that, or are the non-public staff just sort of doing their parts for different portions of the progress report, and then you as the LEA are expected to finalize that? Like you want to you want to flesh that out. And here is another slide with additional things to consider for an MOA. And again, that webinar back in January, in that webinar they have had a sample MOA that they showcased during that webinar and other materials to help you put one into place if, if you're interested in doing that. Um, Reevaluation. It often comes up like who's supposed to get the ball rolling for reevaluation? Is the non-public expecting you as the LEA to notify the parent and get the ball rolling and ordering assessments? Or is the non-public fully taking over this process and already working on doing assessments as part of that triennial evaluation? Um, so these, if you don't know who's doing what and you are the LEA SEPOC, um, then I strongly encourage you to get in touch with each non-public campus, have a conversation about um, how you're going to flush these things out and maybe put, put some of it in writing. So, and in addition, I do want to point out the consideration of the least restrictive environment annually. Um, students who are placed at non-publics, uh, once they go there, they are not supposed to just stay there forever. Each year, you're supposed to re um, rethink through whether or not th that is still the appropriate environment for the student because it is a much more restrictive environment for them to be away at a non-public campus, away from their non-disabled peers, um, considering whether or not they are ready to transition back to your LEA campus is something that you need to be formally considering each year. And one last slide on MOA development. Um, perhaps you and the non-public don't talk very much. Maybe you want to put in writing how you're going to communicate. If you do not know who the non-public SEDS point of contact is at each of the non-public campuses where you have students, please get in touch with the non-public and find out who that is. Or you can reach out to Aussie. We have a list of those people as well. Um, because you should be in regular communication with them regarding um, your students. And anything else that your LEA, any processes or policies you have in place, you want to make sure that the non-publics are aware of those and following those as well. Okay, and now we want to remind you that um, 
in overseeing non-publics, one of the major areas of concern that pops up is service provision. There is often um, a lack, sometimes there's a lack of documentation or um, about service provision. Sometimes there's misunderstandings about the non-public of like who's supposed to be logging the services and, and also generating service trackers. And you as the LEA SCPSC need to make sure that you've communicated very clearly with the non-public about those expectations. And we have given you a tool, the, the Related Services Management Report in Click, um, that you currently have access to. The non-publics currently do not have access to that. Um, that is a work in progress. So we want, um, you should be using that tool on a regular basis to oversee what's going on at the non-public campuses for service delivery. And you should also be checking in SEDS to make sure that service trackers are being generated. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So, and of course, you can always reach out to Aussie if you're trying to get a hold of the non-public and they're not being very responsive, or you feel like they're being derelict in their duties in any way. You can always reach out directly to Aussie. Um, I will type the I'm typing in the chat box the email for Dr. Edgar Stewart. He is the manager over the non-public monitoring and compliance team. If you ever have concerns about what's going on with the non-public, definitely contact him directly and he will work with you to look into that. So um, here is also an example of a way that you could keep tabs on non-public staff, making sure that they have the appropriate um, credentials, the appropriate training. Um, for example, with SEDS, um, you, OSI creates SEDS accounts for non-publics, but you then go give access to student files in SEDS. And so if uh, we encourage you to um, you know, keep track of who you're granting that access to, and um, you can provide them training, you can, uh, all sorts of things. And um, Seats and Squires, if you're not familiar with those, Seats and Squires are two database systems that non-publics have to use. There's actually a webinar training on those coming up on Friday for non-publics for those who aren't trained on that. So that's not for you directly, but just to know they have other databases that they have to be kept up with as well. Okay, speaking of related services, let's talk about service provision. It's always a hot topic, always fun. It's delivered services, missed services, makeup services, all those things. Just a couple minutes spent on reminding you about how in your role you need to oversee service provision across your entire LEA, including students at both non-publics and at your LEA public campuses. Here's a quote from the Aussie Related Services Policy, which has been around since 2010, but is still in effect. LEAs are responsible for ensuring that service providers implement and document all instances of actual and attempted service delivery. If you wanna read more, there is a link at the bottom of the page to that Related Services Policy. So in your role, this means um, you're overseeing what's going on at all of your campuses, including the non-publics. And this also means that you need to be training related service providers to correctly log services. Um, last month in October, we OSSI offered a live training webinar in which we demonstrated a two, that webinar was geared towards related service providers who are new to SEDS to sort of get them started in the basics of logging a service, doing a service tracker, and doing a progress report. Um, we had some internet connectivity issues during that webinar, and so um, I know that was really frustrating for some of the people that were watching live. So we've been working on editing that, and it's about to be posted online as an archived recorded webinar, and so we will make you aware when that's been posted online so that you can share that link with your service providers who are new or who are looking for uh, more training and how to do the basics and sets of logging a service and generating the service tracker. And, um, and so that's, that's forthcoming, and we'll have a, a slide deck with some screenshots in conjunction with that. Um, but here are some questions that come up. Sometimes people want to know when they're supposed to do a log. Um, it's, it's, 
it's more obvious. It's more intuitive that you need to do a service log after you have a delivered service session. Um, but then sometimes it's unclear about, well, what about missed services? Well, if a session was scheduled to occur but was missed, that's when you should be logging it as a missed service. So, for example, if the student was supposed to come in on Tuesday and get a service, but the student was absent, then you would create a log to document that, to, to log that 30 minutes occurred where the service was not delivered. It was attempted but not delivered. Um, and so logging those are just as important as logging the delivered services. Now, if it's a holiday in December, if your school's closed for two weeks in December, you, we don't expect you to be delivering services and you should not have services scheduled. So there's not a reason to make create missed service logs for Christmas Day when you probably never even had services scheduled or expected to occur on that day anyway. So hopefully that can help you see when you should do a missed service log and when you do not. Um, but that policy, you can go read more on this in this policy. There's a specific section about missed services there. And the deadline, um, you should, service providers should go into SEDS and create and finalize that service log within five business days of delivering the service. Now, service log versus service tracker. This comes up again and again. Sometimes a service provider thinks once they do the log that they're done, um, but there is an additional step that needs to be done um, at a different time. A service log is simply where they enter the data into SEDS to capture you know, the minutes and the, the status and if it was delivered or a missed service that creates a, a standalone log. But then there is a separate document, it's a PDF document, the service tracker. Sometimes we call it a service ticket. This is a document that is generated, it's an official legal document that generates a, and it can show a bunch of logs all on the same document um, according to whatever time frame you set. And this PDF document does have a place for a signature um, and you can print it off, sign it, fax it back into SEDS, whether or not you're required to do that. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, but the actual generation of these service trackers, the service provider is responsible for doing that and they often forget to do that. And so um, it would, it's, let's just talk about how they would do that for a minute. So the wizard section of SEDS is where a service provider logs the services using a logging wizard. And it's also where they do a service tracker and a progress report using these different wizards. I don't know why they're called wizards, but that's kind of fun. So a service tracker is a separate process in SEDS. How often they do a service tracker, that is up to you as the LEA. A service tracker needs to be generated um, according, for OSSEs purposes, we need to see a service tracker at least once a month generated. Um, and if it's only generated once a month, then that tracker should show all of the service logs for that entire month. And that's a, a common practice to just at the end of each month, the service provider generates this tracker for each of their students. And, it, and it's this official PDF document that shows services for the entire month. You as the LEA, you can require more frequent service tracker generation. For example, if you want all your providers to generate a service tracker at the end of each week with the date range showing all of the service logs for that week, you can, you, you can require that. That is up to you. Some LEAs I've heard of have required require um, a service tracker to be generated for each individual service session, and that's fine too. It's up to you. But for OSSEs purposes, we need to see service trackers at least one month at a time, and between all the service trackers, it should cover it should show all of the logs that occurred over that time period. Now for the signature. The service tracker does have a place for, for the provider to sign off. Um, and in the past, it was required to print off, sign, and fax back in that tracker. However, for several years now, OSSEE has not required the physical signature on that tracker. Rather, we 
um, consider the fact that the provider is logged in under their private username and they generate that document that constitutes the electronic signature of the provider. So that's sufficient for OSI's purposes. Um, the only exception is if you if the provider was an intern or an assistant, somebody who is not fully licensed, then they would need to print it off and have the fully licensed supervisor sign it. So that is the exception um, for OSI. You as the LEA, you can choose to require a physical signature by all providers if you want to um, for that extra step. It's, it's up to you. Maybe you have a, like a contract with a private vendor who comes and does your related services and you want those to be uh, have physical signatures. That's fine. That's up to you. Just communicate that with all of your providers. And we do encourage you to go check to make sure service trackers are getting generated. Um, you could do a quick spot check. Like if you have a provider at one of your campuses or a non-public that you're not quite sure if they're doing service trackers on a regular basis, you could go into a student's file, pull up their documents page, do a quick spot check to see if you're seeing um, frequent service trackers popping up there on the documents page. So that's one way to, to, to do a, a quick check. Um, now, all of this is building up to the announcement of how OSI is going to um, increase its oversight a little bit more. It's going to crack down a little bit more on this requirement to have service trackers generated as the official documentation, of official you know, signing off by the provider that they did provide these services for purposes of payment. So OSI's non-public payment unit, beginning in January, in just a couple months, they are actually going to start requiring that the tracker is completed by the non-public related service provider, that it's completed and accurate and that it's there in SEDS before they are able to make payment. Now, just let me clarify, it is not a new requirement to generate the service tracker. That requirement has been around for a very long time, but it is a new thing that OSI is now going to require the existence of that tracker before they make payment for related services provided at non-publics. Now, all of the non-publics have been given fair warning about this. They've been given fair warning. They were invited to have their service providers participate in that webinar where we did basic training on how to do a service log and a service tracker. And we did have about 80 different non-public staff participate in that webinar. So they are hopefully paying attention. But what does this mean for you? Um, obviously, in your role, you don't deal with non-public payments, but we just want to give you a heads up that because OSI is cracking down on this, you might have non-public staff that come to you and say, hey, my related service provider uh, can't, lo can't log services and SEDS. What's going on? Help me, help me, um, because th they're under this pressure to get the service tracker done. So you might see an increased request for support in making sure that service providers and non-publics can have access to your students that they provide service for. You also might get more requests to help troubleshoot some of those issues. And you also might get more requests to, for, them to, for you to share with them a copy of the related services management report for their particular non-public campus. So, and again, as a reminder, do not create brand new SEDS accounts for service providers. Um, if you have done this in the past, please submit a ticket in the Aussie support tool um, to let us know that you created an account and work with Aussie to deactivate that account and get that service provider back on track with their aggregate account. And speaking of the related services management report, I'm going to turn the time over to Leah to talk for a few minutes about an update on who has access to that related services management report in Click. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Annette. Um, so currently, Aussie is in the process of allowing um, more users. We received um, or purchased a lot more tokens. So with that, we are going to allow um, service level providers at, um, at the LA campuses and school level users um, and related service providers that have access to the RSMR. So we are still in the process of um, 
of allowing this to occur. So the estimated time frame is January 2018, uh, and we will have more information um, in a little bit regarding the release of these tokens. With that being said, prior to full access for all service providers, the LEA SCPOC should routinely share RSMR data with the appropriate campus level staff. Here on the slide, we um, have some information as to how to do so. So in the RSMR, you're gonna filter data to the campus level using the introduction sheet. You're gonna export the data to a shareable format. In order to do so, you would right click. Um, and then you're gonna share the data using a secure method. So remember that this contains sensitive student information. Be very mindful as to how you export and share this information to other users. The next slide here just has a little bit of information as to how to create a report and export it. So the RSMR provides the ability for the LASAPOC to select specific drill downs for the sheets. After the selections have been completed, close the page and right click to export the data to generate the, an Excel spreadsheet. And here we have an example of the selection that is helpful if the POC wants to monitor service provisions at a non-public campus and view all information requested by all providers for students at that campus. Again, please be mindful that you are selecting students at the particular campus, that you are selecting the correct provider when you are exporting this data and sharing it because it does have student level information. So, and just to put you back on that, thank you, Leah. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a couple poll questions, and then we have a question for you to get your input regarding this. So my first poll question for you is we are wondering how often you personally use the Related Services Management Report, how often you use that app within Click. Thank you for taking the time to vote. We are interested to know how often you are using the RSMR tool in Click. Okay. Great, thank you. And then we are also interested to know how often do you share, how often do you export and share data? from the Related Services Management Report with other people. And this is a check all that applies. So you can actually check more than one box for this answer. We're interested to know, are you already in the habit of sharing information from this report with other people at your LEA, maybe maybe special education coordinators or, or a supervisor over Related Services? Maybe a service provider directly requested from you to share information? Um, as a reminder, the RSMR report in SEDS was sunsetted back in May of 2017, and this Click app is now the only related services management report tool available. And as Leah shared with us, OSSI is working to expand access to all service providers, but in the interim, they rely on you to provide them this type of report. And it's up to you how often and how you share it with them, but we definitely strongly encourage you um, to, to have that relationship with them so that they can um, be strengthened in how they oversee their own services. Thank you for voting with that. And, and as a um, final question, this is an open-ended question, so we want you to type into the chat box. Um, as we're ramping up to give access to the RSMR to a lot more people, we also are ramping up our, the types of resources and training we have available for that. Um, what specific things about the RSMR would you like to see training on? And what specific, what specific things in the RSMR would you like to know how to do? So this is an open-ended question. Again, you just type your answer in your question chat box. We're interested in knowing specifically what you'd like to be able to do with the RSMR. Um, also specifically, what 
what you'd like to be able to share with somebody else. Um, so, if, for example, if there's certain types of information you'd like to be able to um, filter and pull together in a nice, like, uh, this screen view and be able to export that, give us some ideas of, of how this tool could be most useful for you and the things you'd like to share with others, as well as any parts of it you'd like to receive training on. We currently have um, some introductory, like, get started with the RSMR uh, video trainings available online, um, and now we want to take that to the next level. So we appreciate your input. And as you're thinking about that, we are going to wrap up the webinar. A reminder that this Friday, November 17th, is the deadline to make sure that every single student who is eligible to take the alternate assessment has an IEP that says so and has the proper document in place. Now, last month, we gave more in-depth training. Michael Craig from our assessment team talk to you more in depth about the process by which Aussie is going to be reviewing the applications to take the alternate assessment. Um, this is nothing new. This is something that happens every year. So this should sound very familiar to you if you've been around for a while. If you're new to your role this year, hopefully you've been getting this information or you're testing. Your LEA test coordinator should have been getting this information. Now, this is not any extra work for you. This is essentially just saying make sure the IEP is correct um, because this Friday is like the cutoff date and then after that Aussie's going to pull from SEDS all the students whose IEP says yes they should take the alternate assessment and start doing their review of those to determine if those students are in fact eligible to take the alternate assessment. So what you need to make sure is done by Friday and again this is just a reminder this was announced um, a, much earlier in the school year for students who are taking the alternate assessment that their IEP is current and finalized, that their IEP says yes, they take the alternate assessment, and that the participation criteria form is complete. Um, this used to be a worksheet. It used to be a worksheet that you would download, fill out, and upload back into SEDS as a PDF. The worksheet has questions about the student um, that walks you through the eligibility process, asking questions about their level of functioning and things to help you determine if they're eligible. So that a copy of that worksheet needs to already be in the student's file in SEDS, or it needs to be um, done electronically by the deadline. Um, October 23rd is the date by which SEDS had a very small update to where instead of filling out a worksheet, you actually type the information directly into SEDS. Like the questions asked on the worksheet are actually asked within SEDS. So if, it's, if it was after October 23rd when you did an annual IEP update or an amendment, you probably noticed that the form was then embedded into SEDS instead of the worksheet. If you would made this decision for the student a long time ago as part of their annual IEP, you do not need to do an amendment as long as the IEP is correct for the status, and as long as that PDF worksheet is still there, you should be fine. Um, but if there are any students, outstanding students, who you need to do an amendment to say yes, they need to take the alternate, or no, they do not take the alternate, or if there's any students who's who has that worksheet missing, you need to get that taken care of by Friday. And then, of course, according to the timeline, there will be some time to go back and forth with OSSI during the appeals process if there's any issues over whether or not a student is eligible. Okay, we're wrapping up the webinar with some reminders and announcements. Um, Leah's going to make a quick announcement about something that some of you are aware of with the unified data errors. Thank you, Annette. Um, some of you may noticed, or have noticed that in the uh, CLIC uh, Unified Data Errors application that um, an error is showing um, separate school for a student. Um, if the student is attending a non-public school and you have selected a separate school on the student's IEP, um, we are aware of this issue. We are working towards a resolution um, and we are hoping that this will be resolved by the end of this week. Thanks, Leah. And as our last announcement, of course, we'd like to keep you informed of upcoming professional development opportunities for you or your staff. 
restorative practices is a big um, a big thing that Aussie is really uh, providing a lot of, of training around this year. This can help, especially with the students that have behavior challenges, um, and also to set a more positive culture in your school. So we encourage you to pass this information along to your colleagues about upcoming opportunities for restorative practices. And clicking on these links in the PowerPoint will take you to the registration page. We also have upcoming trainings that may be of interest to you that relate somewhat to special education. We have a response to intervention training. We have a secondary transition training, which is highly recommended for those, for your staff who are new to secondary transition, or maybe even at the middle school level, as we know the law is changing next year to make the mandatory age for secondary transition planning go down to age 14 instead of 16. And we have our very popular nonviolent crisis intervention training to give skills to your staff on how to de-escalate situations um, before they come violent, become violent and personal safety techniques in the case that a student does act out physically. And to get the, the best way to find out about professional development opportunities is to get the LEA Look Forward newsletter. This is where the most up-to-date information will be published. Um, yes, we do have a professional development calendar, but that only gets updated monthly. This gets updated weekly. If you are not subscribed, we encourage you to subscribe by emailing Aussie Communications. And if you just want to go look at the newsletter without subscribing or without waiting for the Wednesday email, you can always go see any recent version of the newsletter at this website here. Thank you for joining us today. December's webinar is on the second Wednesday of December, not the third Wednesday. If you tune in on the third Wednesday, December 20th, um, you won't hear anything. But we uh, remind you to put this on your calendar. If you are registered for today, you are automatically registered for the one on the 13th. So Wednesday, December 13th is the next webinar. You will be hearing from Aussie's new um, director over the compliance and monitoring team, and they will be talking about the, the IDEA monitoring process, about the new manual, and all sorts of things with compliance and monitoring um, next month. So stay tuned. And again, thank you for joining us. We'll stay on the line for a few minutes to attempt to, to continue answering questions. And we look forward to seeing you in December. Have a great Thanksgiving holiday. One of you had a good question about the alternate assessment eligibility for second graders. As you know, the PARC test does not start until the third grade year. So if you are doing an annual IEP update for a second grader, um, just think about whether or not the second grader will be taking the PARC test as a third grader before the next annual IEP update. So um, if you, there's no harm in doing the worksheet, but it won't really count for anything as a second grader because they're not yet of, of testing age. Um, but if you are doing, let's say, for example, you're doing an IEP annual update in May of this year for a second grader, and they will very shortly become a third grader, then we definitely would encourage you to go ahead and fill out, answer the questions for the testing participation eligibility. <coughs> Great question, thank you. We also have a question about the alternate assessment worksheet. If it was if it was uploaded at the annual IEP last year and the annual IEP date has not come up yet this year, you should be okay as long as the Aussie assessment team is able to go and easily locate that worksheet uploaded at, at the last annual IEP meeting, you should not have to do it again. 
So again, if at the last annual IEP meeting, the student, if you said yes for the alternate assessment that they are eligible, and you did the worksheet and uploaded it at the last annual IEP, you should be good to go, as long as that worksheet's easy to find by the Aussie team. There's no need to do it again until the next annual IEP update. And at the, the next time you go to do your annual IEP update, it won't be a worksheet anymore because it now is built in to SEDS and the questions are built into the part of the IEP process for testing participation. Great question.